Take your Bibles, please. We're turning to Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30, it's the first book of the Bible, of course, and you'll be finding the 30th chapter, and then we'll be reading verses 17 through 24. So Genesis chapter 30, beginning with verse 17, I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's holy and precious word. And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire, because I have given my maiden to my, to my husband, and she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again and bore Jacob the sixth son. And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me, because I have borne him six sons. And she called his name Zebulun. And afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. And God remembered Rachel, verse 22, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Beautiful. Thank you, Wendy. We appreciate that. What a fitting corporate prayer as a prelude to God's people moving into their time of corporate study. And what a fitting prayer to pray as we exit the corporate study of the Word of God. Oh, that he would indeed be our all in all. Let's pray together. Well, God, you are so good, so great, so gracious, so merciful, so long-suffering, so kind, so tender-hearted. You are the seeking and saving God, but you are also the omnipotent God, the omniscient God, the omnipresent God. You are the sovereign God who is in control of all things, and you are holy, we really ought to have your perfect, multifaceted character in mind each and every time that we open up the pages of your book. And as noted, what a fitting prayer, O oh God, that you would indeed be our all in all. If you are our all in all, then the word of God is our all in all. And all we care about are your, your things, the ministry that you've entrusted to our care, and our faithfulness to the faithful God of whom we have sung. So I pray that uh, you would find us hearts with hearts cultivated and ready to receive your truth again this morning, and excited, anxious to allow the Holy Spirit of God not only, of course, to turn the light on for us, but to take this truth and apply it in a most practical way in our lives. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our, our study in Genesis continues. We are following the Old Testament patriarch, Jacob. Uh, see if you follow this with me. Jacob has four wives. Jacob's first love and second wife, Rachel, is barren. And Jacob's first wife, but second love, Leah, has afforded to Jacob no less than six sons. Then Jacob, via both Rachel's and Leah's handmaids, has fathered another four sons, and so we are up to ten. We arrive at the place in the narrative where there's a, an air of excitement because Rachel is finally about to bear. Uh, but before we get to the succinct account of that, an interesting insertion in the narrative, I'm referring to Genesis chapter 30 and verse 21. Take a look as I read. And afterwards she bore, we're speaking now of Leah, and afterwards she bore a daughter 
and called her name Dinah. If you've been with us, you know that the narrative has been so very focused on Jacob bearing sons. And because of that, you may all along have been wondering if Jacob has any daughters. And so we are here introduced to Dinah. And although Dinah may be Jacob's first daughter, she is not his only daughter. We know from Genesis chapter 37 and verse 35 that Jacob had other daughters as well. But Dinah is the only one that is named, and I believe that for two reasons. One, she probably was indeed Jacob's firstborn daughter, and then two, she's listed by name here because of an incident that will later take place in the narrative, which we obviously will be getting to the Lord willing. But again, here, just a no-nonsense, isn't it interesting? Succinct, matter-of-fact listing. Jacob has a daughter. Her name is Dinah. Now, we, we come to Rachel, who is finally about to bear a son to Jacob. Although Rachel, like the other characters in the narrative, has been influenced by her culture, playing the culture card, as we have dubbed it. And she has, on a number of occasions, demonstrated not her faith, but her faithlessness. The fact is, with a view to her barrenness, we have been rooting for her. We go back in our mind's eye when Rachel first met Jacob. Again, if you've been with us, and of course you guys are broadly good students of the word, and so you would have understanding about this, but we here at Calvary, we go back in our mind's eye to the time when Rachel first met Jacob. Again, it was love at first sight. And by the way, young people, so you know I'm not exclusively promoting just that particular terminology. It was clear that it was a God thing right from the get-go. God had been clearly, divinely orchestrating. I have no doubt, by the way, and listen, I know, I want you to know that I know that, um, that, that Jacob was tricked into marrying Leah. And I have referenced with you many, many times the human mess, not just the carnality, but even the sinfulness. But I have no doubt, just so that you know, just so that you continue to keep God's perspective, just so that you continue to see the way things could have been. I have no doubt that if Jacob and Rachel from the very beginning would have fully depended upon and trusted in God, even and especially back during the time extended of her barrenness, that Rachel herself would have borne all 12 sons to Jacob. Class, God can do that. And as an indication of it, here's barren Rachel. Aren't you a little bit embarrassed? Barrenness, we would throw up our hands in despair and say, woe is me. No reason to even go on living. And here's Baron Rachel about to bear. Oh, if we would just trust God. And listen, God does use other people, but it's never in conflict with the word of God. It isn't that God doesn't use other people, and it's not that God doesn't use circumstances and things. But when he does, it is always perfectly consistent with the inscripturated word of God. Oh, that we would just trust God. 
the God with whom nothing is impossible. Oh, that we would just wait on God. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Wait on the Lord. It's interesting, too, to note the legacy that Jacob, again, this is an advantage of having systematically studied our way up to this point. It's interesting to note the legacy Jacob had been given. His father and mother, Isaac and Rebekah, although not perfect in their faith, left Jacob a good example. Because, and we tend to forget these things, Rebekah, this all-important matriarch, who was not yet a matriarch because she was barren, Rebecca too was barren, but instead of going willy nilly, I think that's a Winnie the Pooh reference. Willy nilly, silly old bear. Until I got grandchildren who no longer watch such things. Only Papa. Instead of going willy-nilly and playing the culture card as we have seen and bringing in multiple wives, where's the women? Isaac, I could weep simply, and I'm quoting, entreated the Lord for his wife, end quote. Isaac refusing to play the culture card, just in case, you know, this philosophy, hey, everybody's doing it, so it's A-OK. -okay. Well, the fact of the matter is God has always had a remnant. The question is, are you and I going to be a part of it or not? Isaac refusing to play the culture card, resisting the temptation to sin his way to the will of God. which, by the way, is a misnomer, but very popular among some. Can I lay a little bit of Christmas on you? Isn't there such a thing as Christmas in July? So here you go. Reminded me of the mother of Christ, Mary. Mary who, by the way, through and through was a sinner just like you and me. That's why in her Magnificat, she sings of God, her Savior. But one of my favorite parts of the true Christmas story is Mary's absolute refusal to sin her way to the will of God. Dramatic. God, through the angel Gabriel, as you know, appears to Mary and instructs her that she's going to have a son. And not just any son. She was going to have the Son of God. Who we ask? Theos. She was going to have Mashiach, the Messiah. She was going to have the Christ, the Anointed One, Christos. She was going to have the Savior of the world, Jesus. And I love the very first thing out of her mouth in response to that annunciation. You recall we're not turning, but for reference, Luke 1 and 34. How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? By the way, and it's kind of neat, you can, you know, have some, uh, you, you know, you can, you can gain some insight from even the most uh, simplistic observations in honor of the grammar. 
as Mary in her statement employs the present tense. The present tense speaks of habitual, continuous, ongoing activity. And with a view to that, it's prompted me to render and listen, I'm standing on a holy ground and I do so with fear and trembling. But in the past, again, class, you will recognize that I have rendered it similar to this. Mary saying to the annunciating angel, ultimately to God, how shall this be, seeing that I have not known a man, that I am not knowing a man, and until I'm married, I will not be knowing a man. Wow, how moving God, I don't know how you're going to do it. Oh, again, dramatic God, I don't know how you're going to do this, but it will not be through my sinning. It will not be through my breaking of the inscripturated law of God. Oh, for such holy and godly and spiritual and biblical resolve. I will not sin my way to anything, even including the supposed will of God. Again, dramatic. So, hey, there's some Christmas in July for you. Isn't that exciting? Enough said about that, I think. Now, quickly engage with me the short narrative regarding Rachel's bearing. I'm speaking of chapter 30, of course, in verses 22 through 24. Take a look as I reread. Genesis 30 and verse 22. Wow, so much here. I love this. And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bore her a son and said, God, if you're thinking that I've highlighted this in my Bible, you are correct. God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, The Lord shall add to me another son. Three quick observations. Note first that when Rachel finally bears, there's no mention of mandrakes. You would have had to have been with us to appreciate this. When Rachel finally bears, there's no mention of mandrakes. I guess I will take you back. We have a couple minutes to do that. Go back in the same chapter to verse 14. I'm going to read the three verses here. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field, this magical fruit. And Reuben went in the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. Remember, Rachel is barren. And she said unto her, it is, is it a small matter? Is it a small matter that thou hast taken away my husband, Leah speaking, and wouldst thou take away my son's mandrakes also? Mandrakes, mandrakes, mandrakes. And Rachel said, therefore he shall lie with thee. Here's this almost sickening bargaining that we've already considered. He shall lie with me tonight for thy son's, guess what, mandrakes. So Leah gets a night, for, a night with Jacob, who has more and more of late been spending time with Rachel, and, and Rachel gets the magical fruit. Isn't it interesting? We often are noting the succinctness of the narrative, and because of that, you have to be careful because there are times when days, months, and sometimes even years transpire, and there's really nothing directly in the narrative to alert you to that except for some tiny details. It is probably, remember, what ends up unfolding with Leah then... But when we get to verse 22, our focus transitions from Leah to Rachel. And again, now Rachel is about to bear. And not a single reference to mandrakes. 
but four references to the God who opens and shuts wombs. So, you know, if you're carrying around a bag of mandrakes and you're hoping for some magic, you might want to find somebody who has a tiny little petting zoo or farm and feed it to the animals. God. 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 Observation number one. Observation number two. Rachel calls her son Joseph, and of course you guys know and are anticipating that we will say much more about Joseph down the road. In fact, the Genesis narrative ultimately ends up focusing in on him. But here we simply engage his name. This is per the spirit of God's prompting using the narrative. Rachel names her son Joseph because, Rachel says, and I'm quoting, the Lord shall add to me another son. Can you imagine, I, again, the pathos? And again, the succinctness of the narrative does not necessarily lend us to the pathos. Can you imagine Rachel, after being barren for such an extended period of time and being in heated, knocked down, dragged out competition with her sister Leah... Can you imagine what it was like for Rachel first to discover that she's about to bear, finally about to bear, and then on top of that, the divine promise that another son will be forthcoming. Wow. How exciting. That's observation number two. And observation number three, I was going to say forgive me for the simplicity, but no. Don't miss the power and import of prayer. Did you catch that verse 22? And God remembered Rachel and God, God hearkened to her. We see it at every turn. We have it not only by way of principle, old through new, but we have example after example after example. The one thing that we can say without hesitation from a broad standpoint with a view to the topic of prayer is that we are not yet praying enough. And so we welcome any opportunity for God not only to challenge us, but even more importantly to encourage us in this all-important thing, the power and import of prayer. I remind you, if you're sitting here this morning saved, 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 and there's nothing in life more important than that, how you arrived at that, and listen, I'm very aware of the seeking and saving God. I'm very aware of the wooing of the Holy Spirit of God. I am certainly aware of Christ's all-important blood sacrifice on Calvary's cross and his burial and resurrection. But if you and I are sitting here saved uh, this morning, it is via prayer. You prayed. You prayed. This is how you demonstrated your faith and trust in Christ. You prayed. You listen to Romans 10, 13, but whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And there was that point in time in your life when you called. In John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons and daughters of God. You're saved this morning, and I trust you are. And if you are not, I would love, love, love to sit down with you. Share more with you about the one and only Savior from sin. Yours. Mine. 
prayer ushers us into the Christian life. And then I'm not telling you anything new. Again, I could have said, forgive me for the simplicity of it all. Prayer sustains and makes effective Christian living. It not only ushers you into the Christian life, it sustains and makes effective Christian living. And having, having brought you along with me that far, I am asking two concluding questions. One, have you prayed? Emphasis on past tense. That is, has there been a point in time in your life when you saw your desperate need of Christ because of your sin and you turned from your sin to put faith and trust in Christ and did so by praying, inviting Christ into your heart and life as your own personal Savior, acknowledging, accepting him? Have you prayed? Emphasis on past tense. To receive Christ as your personal Savior from sin. And two, are you praying? Emphasis on present tense. Are you and I prayers? Not only have we prayed, but are we praying? Are we praying for divine strength? Are we praying for divine guidance? Are we praying for divine direction? Are we praying, well, almost all the time with very few short intermissions, praying for Thessalonians 5.17 without ceasing? Do you pray before you begin your day? No, seriously. Do you pray before you begin your day? Do you pray before you enter the workplace? Young people, do you pray before you enter the classroom? You athletes, do you pray before you enter the gym? And folks, do we pray before we enter these gates? Do we pray before we go to church? Can you imagine how your and my life, both as individuals and corporately as a church, would be absolutely transformed if everyone who entered these gates this morning did so prayerfully before God? Man, you can read a dozen and a half books as to you know, how you can be prosperous and all of these other crazy things. But wow, our lives would be transformed if we were praying. So I'm leaving you with two questions. One, have you prayed? Emphasis on past tense. What I mean by that, again, is have you put your faith and trust in Christ? And if not, I would love to speak to you. And two, are you praying? Is that what you are? A prayer. God help us. Lord, thank you for these considerations. Once again, we're acknowledging, and it's to your glory, obviously, that these things couldn't be any more applicable to our lives. And in the end, we are left with a number of life lessons, but primarily this, the import and power of prayer. I know that you'd be pleased with us even if we left this place with a renewed determination to pray more. But, oh God, what would happen if we were actually prayers? What would happen if we actually were obedient to 
principled commands like 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, where we would pray without ceasing, that we would just be almost constantly talking to you, God, that there would be only short seasons in our lives apart from that. And oh, the dramatic change even in my life if I prayed every time before I entered a particular arena in life. Oh God, make us prayers. So save, God, please, those who need to be saved. And then stir the hearts of the saints. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.